The South Cornish coast is the gem of Britain's 7,000 miles of shoreline. Thousands of years ago, before the first tin mines were opened, the coastline here was very different. As the ice cap receded, vast amounts of meltwater caused the sea level to rise. Coastal rivers like the Fal were inundated by 200 feet of salt water. A new marine community developed here. When Cornish was a living language, this was called Indan Anfala, a valley beneath the sea. Dawn breaks over the fowl. There's an eerie silence. The animals of the night have already retired, and those of the day are about to awake. The tide is on the turn, and the river lies as calm as a mill pool. Turnstones have roosted on the sheltered upper reaches, but they will spend the day feeding along the more exposed shores at the mouth of the estuary. The Fal estuary is Britain's largest natural harbour. The rising seas that drowned the river valley created a wide variety of habitats making this one of the richest marine environments in Europe. Inland, the intertidal mudflats were formed largely from China clay waste from the workings upstream on the Cornish moors. The mud banks are very productive. They support a large population of migrant and resident waterfowl. A pair of mute swans has nested on the river bank above the neat tides. As the high spring tides approach, the water line moves progressively nearer the nest. Before long, the water is lapping around the eggs. The female tries to build up the nest with weed, but her efforts are in vain. Within a few minutes, the nest is drowned. At high tide, the eggs lie beneath several feet of water. They are now part of an alien world where they're an object of curiosity to some of the local inhabitants. But there's little chance of the shore crabs finding a meal here. The muddy banks have a rich fauna. In terms of productivity, they're comparable with a tropical rainforest. There's little cover here. An old wreck, deep below the surface, in the bed of the original river, provides a focal point for a host of wildlife. A black goby has taken up residence inside an old beer can. Once the female spawned, the male drove her away, he remained to protect the eggs until they hatch. But while he maintains his vigil at the entrance to the can, a tiny sea slug, a species that eats only fish eggs, has sneaked in to feed. The wreck a coal transporter that sank in the 1950s is now covered by colorful plumose anemones. They feed by filtering the water, rich in nutrients. Above, the scrub oaks along the river bank reach down to the water's edge, dipping their branches into the sea. 
Nearer the mouth of the estuary is the nearest equivalent in Britain to a coral reef. It's made up of a pink coralline seaweed called mel. Each nodule, the size of a tennis ball, may be 30 years old. Like any reef, it supports a large population of marine life. A snake lox anemone spreads its tentacles in search of prey. The prawn, paralyzed by the anemone's stinging cells, has no chance of escape. The sponge crab, however, is a frequent visitor to the anemones. Immune to the stinging cells, it finds a safe refuge among the tentacles. Its legs and carapace are covered in sponges which provide camouflage, and even the occasional meal. A closely related species uses seaweed as camouflage. It breaks off small pieces of weed and impales them on the spines that cover its body and legs. This behavior earns it the name decorator crab. If it moves to another patch of weed, it strips off its cloak and replaces it within 24 hours. Small fish, like this rare couch's goby, live under the nodules, emerging only to feed. They're wary for a very good reason. This part of the river is a hunting ground for predatory birds. A heron doesn't distinguish between the rarer and the more common species. This unique habitat covers several acres of riverbed. It supports marine life as varied as that of any tropical coral reef. A flatworm, just over an inch long, glides over and through the male. Not all the animals are free to come and go around the reef. Some of them are rooted to the spot, anchored among the nodules. A tiny fan worm lives inside a calcareous tube, which it secretes as it grows. It collects food from the water using its long orange filaments. One of them is modified to form a plug for the tube. A fan worm is vulnerable while it's feeding. A Tom Pot Blenny tries to bite off a few filaments before the worm can retreat into its tube, but the worm has lightning reactions and the fish is rarely successful. Fan worms are hermaphrodite with both male and female reproductive systems, but they produce only one type of sex cell at a time. Spawning usually takes place at midsummer. While some worms release sperm into the water, others produce eggs. A tiny larva develops after fertilization. Eventually, it will settle on a suitable substrate to begin growing and secreting its chalky tube. Closer to the sea, a flock of black-headed gulls is feeding along the shoreline. The water here is shallow and clear. This was once the floodplain of the original river. A compass jellyfish, as big as a soup plate, pulsates through the water. The long filaments are armed with stinging cells which paralyze its prey.
Where the sandy seabed receives enough sunlight, beds of eelgrass flourish. Eelgrass, our only marine flowering plant, is as rich in animal life as the male nearby. The weaver fish is a slow and clumsy swimmer. It's adapted to living in the sand, with its eyes and mouth placed high on its head so that it can strike upwards at prey. The poisonous spines on its gill covers and along its dorsal fin can cause very painful wounds to the feet of bathers. The eelgrass meadows are home to a wide variety of fish. The 15-spined stickleback, like its freshwater relative, builds a nest among the weed. The white guy ropes that bind the nest to the weed are formed from a sticky secretion produced by the male. Once the leaves are held in place, the stickleback lines its nest with fine red weeds. Next, it will try to attract a female to spawn in the newly built nest. The stickleback is a resident of the eelgrass all the year round, but the cuttlefish come here only to breed. When they reach adult size, about a foot long, the cuttlefish move into the eelgrass from deeper water in the early summer. Many of them are already in pairs. The male, the larger and more brightly colored of the two, displays to his mate. He will remain with the female throughout courtship, defending her against other males. Mating takes place head to head. During the embrace, the male transfers sperm to the female using one of his 10 tentacles, modified for the purpose. He will stay with her until spawning is completed. Eggs are laid one at a time, each one firmly attached to the eelgrass. The female moves in, wraps her tentacles round the leaf, and deposits an egg. As she moves away, she blows water over the eggs and prepares to lay the next one. Through egg laying, the male remains in close contact with the female, touching her body with his tentacles and his undulating fin. Each female cuttlefish will lay several dozen eggs during the spawning session, which can last well over an hour. The adults never return to deeper water. Spawning is the last act of their brief lives. Once it's complete, they die, leaving the eggs to develop in the safety of the eelgrass meadows. Three months later, the eggs are ready to hatch. Each has swollen to the size of a grape. Their nickname is Sea Raisin, and each contains a fully formed miniature cuttlefish looking for a way out. The young cuttlefish makes a hole in the egg wall using chemicals produced from an organ at the tip of its tail.
Barely half an inch long, the baby cuttlefish sets off immediately in search of food. Prawns are a favorite prey animal. The cuttlefish can kill a prawn twice its own size. Its horny beak cuts through the prawn's tough shell to reach the muscles inside. Young cuttlefish that hatch early in the season will be fully grown and ready to return to the eelgrass as adults by the following summer. The exposed rocky shores round the seaward edge of the estuary, outside the natural harbour, are cut by deep fissures and gullies. Few animals can live between the tides in these wave-swept areas, but at low tide, some of the creatures from deeper water can be seen from the rocks. This is a sea butterfly, a mollusk related to the snails. It swims upside down with a curious rolling motion. If it's attacked, it can release copious quantities of mucus full of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. With such powerful chemical defenses, it has no need of an external shell. It has a small shell inside to support its body. The kelp forest, a stand of giant seaweeds, is home to a variety of marine life at different levels, just like a forest on land. Sea urchins graze on the holdfasts where the kelp is anchored to the bottom. The stems and the fronds are eaten by blue-rayed limpets. Their vivid blue stripes fade as the limpets get older. As they rasp away the surface of the kelp, they leave shallow pits in which they can keep a better grip on the frond in rough weather. The limpets are a major part of the diet of many fish, especially the ballon wrasse that come to feed around the surge gullies and caves. The fish eat the soft parts and the shell, but not the weed where the limpet was feeding. A tompot blenny, with its strange head tentacles, watches for food. Above it, the cave wall is covered with jewel anemones. This tiny species, common in the warmer waters of southwest England, comes in a variety of colors, producing a patchwork effect. The finger-like tentacles are extended to catch food only in strong currents when the tide is rising or falling. A sea slug feels its way across a seaweed frond. The tentacles on top of its head are chemical receptors to help it to find its prey. The stinging cells of the hydroids, which it eats, pass through the sea slug undigested to be stored in the projections on its back, ready to be used in its own defense. A foraging wrasse unwittingly provides the tompot with its next meal. Stinging cells have little effect on the voracious blenny. Deeper down, beyond the reach of sunlight, the plants disappear. They're replaced by colonies of filter-feeding animals, such as soft corals, bryozoans, sponges, and hydroids. On the seabed, a hundred feet below the waves, delicate sea fans stand in the calmer waters. Each one is the size of a dinner plate, standing across the current. The fan is made up of hundreds of tiny creatures, each filtering the water. Among its pink branches, another sea slug is busy feeding. 
It's perfectly camouflaged, visible only when it moves. Once it begins to feed, it merges indistinguishably into the rest of the sea fan. The rock faces within this dark, animal-dominated zone are the home of the rare orange colonial anemone. Nearby is a colony of red dead men's fingers. It's a type of soft coral. The polyps are closely related to anemones. They emerge to filter food from the water. Like anemones, they also come in a variety of colors. One of the most interesting animals that lives at these depths is a striking looking fish. The cuckoo wrasse lives in harems, consisting of one dominant male and several females. The male is distinguished by the bright blue markings all over his head and orange body. If he dies, the dominant female will not only take his place in the pecking order, but she will eventually change sex to become the dominant male. This female has begun the process with some blue markings on her forehead. It's a remarkable system evolved to ensure that all the fish in the group except one are egg producing females. Hermit crabs are often eaten by the wrasse, but this one has a trick up its sleeve, or rather, round its shell. It's covered by a cloak anemone that's armed with a battery of harpoon-like stinging cells that fire when the fish attacks. When the coast is clear, the threads are recoiled for future use. The hermit crab benefits from the protection and the anemone is well placed to pick up any leftovers while the crab is feeding. The foul estuary, with its underwater cliffs and meadows of eelgrass, its coralline reef and mud flats, is indeed one of the richest marine environments in Europe. Where birds once sang in the branches of the scrub oak trees, jellyfish, anemones, Crabs and cuttlefish now flourish in this valley beneath the sea. <laughs>